it got hoarse and sick and he couldn't answer it. I'm like, oh, there's no one here to do it. This is my calling. <laughs> so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames and messieurs, and the millions watching at home, please welcome to the stage with our friend Destiny, Jason Harris. Thanks, JP. That's always awesome. Um, okay, guys. Um, hey, thanks so much for coming out. Um, I've had a blast putting on uh, these events this season. This is our last one this season, and we're really excited about launching the 2020 season. I'm sure you guys will all get information about that as it comes up. Uh, cool thing, we'll actually be expanding this out to the states and in multiple provinces across Canada this next year. So we're super excited about that. Actually, you know what almost I'm really excited about? I just saw on the side of my eye. Sometimes I go squirrel, so I apologize. Um, I just saw on the screen up there, I saw a preview for Rambo. Did anybody know this? Rainbow. There's a remake? <laughs> no. Like, I'm sorry. I was just like, I was just like, it was like Rambo, like Last Blood or something like that. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. All of a sudden I was like, I was getting jacked about coming up here. And then all of a sudden I saw that. I was like, oh. I was like, I'm so excited. All right, guys, I'm going to get this, uh, get this show started. I apologize for the people at home that are watching the live and can't hear the audio on this. I'm going to try to hold it up to the, to the monitor. So using this equation on the upper left right here, I'm projecting that we need to win at least 99 games in order to make it to the postseason. We need to score at least 814 runs in order to win those games and allow no more than 645 runs. What's this? This is the code that I've written for our year-to-year -year projections. This is building in all the intelligence that we have to project players. Okay. It's about getting things down to one number. Using stats the way we read them, will find value in players that nobody else can see. People are overlooked for a variety of biased reasons and perceived flaws. Age, appearance, personality. Bill James and mathematics cut straight through that. Billy, of the 20,000 notable players for us to consider, I believe that there is a championship team of 25 people that we can afford because everyone else in baseball undervalues them. Like an island of misfit toys. Billy, this is Chad Bradford. He's a relief pitcher. He's one of the most undervalued players in baseball. His defect is that he throws funny. Nobody in the big leagues cares about him because he looks funny. This guy could be not just the best pitcher in our bullpen, but one of the most effective relief pitchers in all baseball. This guy should cost $3 million a year. We can get him for 237000 I think I had that exact same computer at one point in time. <laughs> I'm pretty confident. Um, if you guys don't know what this is from, this is from the, the amazing movie um, Moneyball with the story about Billy Bean. And if you guys don't know the story of Billy Bean, I, I really encourage you to go out and uh, read his story. There are several books written on it. There's Moneyball, and then of course there's uh, several stories about him and himself. Um, Island and Misfit Toys, like crap. Is that like the best way to explain our entire industry? Like I'm literally looking out at all of you guys right now and I'm thinking island of misfit toys. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah, well, okay. He's on another island. Um, <laughs> the island of very special misfit toys. Um, <laughs> but, but no, island of misfit toys, that, that really does kind of sum up almost every single dealership I've pretty much walked into in the last 10 years of my, of my career. And I've had a pretty cool career. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity to you know, 
start off with selling cars, uh, work my way up into internet operations on a very early time when internet really operations didn't really exist. In fact, they didn't know what to call it, so that's what they did call it. Uh, had the opportunity to manage a very large BDC department that ran multiple stores over multiple states. By the way, I am American. Please don't hold it against me, okay? You know what's really funny? I, I'm doing a lot of conferences lately, and sometimes I'm either, I do them here in Canada, I also do them in the States. When, um, when I'm down, when I'm down uh, in the States, I'm known as the Canadian, but when I'm up here in Canada, everybody knows me as the American. So I don't know what nationality I am, um, I'm just the island of misfit toys in the automotive industry. I guess that's kind of pretty much where I'm from. So, um, guys, here's what I wanted to start and talk to you guys about today is um, here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn about how to develop a data-driven culture. Now, the word culture gets used a lot, right? And the word data also gets used a lot. Um, we use data in our processes. We use data a lot in when we're talking about marketing. Unfortunately, though, we don't use the word data a lot and culture in kind of the same place. And I'm telling you guys right now, what I'm seeing across the industry, I feel things are getting a little softer, not just here in Canada, the same in the US as well. But visiting as many dealerships as I get an opportunity to do so, what I've, what I've seen is consistent traits, all right? And the one thing that I find real consistent with some of the most successful dealerships in both US and in Canada is culture. So I'm always really curious when I do see this, and I swear it is a bit of a unicorn. You know, I, I feel you'll talk to a lot of dealerships and they, they think they have culture, but you know, what is the culture actually defined? And culture is defined through your team, not necessarily what you as a dealer principal or general manager thoughts are, right? Um, so you know, how do we develop that out? And I'll tell you, with talking to so many dealerships about how they develop the culture, it seems like it was always on the backbone of a process, but it was a process that was driven by data, right? So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit about today. We're also going to talk about uh, data-driven processes and, and goal development, all right? It's one thing to create the goal. It's also one thing to create the process. But if we're not creating that from the data that's in our hands, then we're just kind of just, let me just pull it out of thin air, and that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Um, and then last, building a data-driven team. Now, that, that's going to be kind of the end of this session. Honestly, it'll be the part you're going to probably want to take the most amount of notes. It's, it's really going to be how do we create that team, how do we create that culture with the data that we have at our disposal. So, uh, creating a winning culture. By the way, for you guys who don't know, this is Mr. Billy Bean, all right? No matter how successful you are, change is always good, like always good. And in our industry right now, I'm getting the feeling of, from a lot of people out there, that over the last few years, we've been suffering from something I call full belly syndrome. All right, anybody familiar with full belly syndrome? Okay, I know I was last night when I went out to eat all you can eat sushi. That was totally full belly syndrome. No, I'm just kidding, that's not really full belly syndrome. Full belly syndrome is constantly talking about and considering ourselves of what we accomplish, how much money we made, and not necessarily asking ourselves the question, how much could we have made? How much could we have accomplished if we had taken the time to focus on that percentage of it? You know, it's, it's still funny today, guys, that, you know, closing ratios of 30%, like, woo, and I'm like, okay, what the happened with the other 70% of people that we talked to? Um, but the way we also take that same approach when we're developing out our team. Uh, Billy leadership lessons. He's got some great leadership lessons, and here's a few that are some of my favorites. Hiring and then grooming for talent, okay? So here's what, in the past, you guys have always kind of done. You hired for talent. Right? I mean, seriously, I, I watch these, um, um, these postings for jobs, and it's like for a car dealership six figure income, lots of traffic, huge opportunity. And I'm like, what? What's, what's going on here? Right? And we're constantly looking for that, that superstar. Like, it, we've been, our island of misfit toys have been kind of developed off the background of a superstar culture. And when everything kind of funnels down to that superstar, we don't actually get the opportunity to develop out the team. So what Billy was really great for was hiring, but then grooming that talent, okay? Developing out that individual. You know, hiring them, you know, in our industry, how we translate that over, hiring someone because of their authentic intent to want to serve someone else not because they've sold cars before and you know, or their F&I gross is three grand a copy 
or something along that lines, right? It's hiring for that intent to serve. What supports that culture, hiring for that, we'll fly, <laughs> and then grooming out the individual, their talents. Focus on real problems. Do you know how many times I hear like, well, what if? Like, well, well what, Jason, what, 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 if, what if we hire this person and, and they don't work out in two months? Well, what if you don't hire the person? I mean, who the hell cares, right? Well, what if we hire them and we spend all of our time in training and developing them and then they go work for somebody else? Really? That's your concern? How about you're concerned with more of why the hell they're going to leave? So focusing on real problems. Billy was known for that. And then challenging the status quo. This kind of goes back again. Do you really need experience to sell cars? Or do you, need, do you need the drive, the passion, the intent to want to serve someone else and to provide them an amazing experience, right? Guys, I'm telling you right now, some of the, uh, having my own dealership, all right, some of the best people I ever hired in, uh, hired into the dealership, never sold a car in their life. In fact, I, I remember I had this, I, I hired a group of people kind of all simultaneously at once, right? Um, started developing them out. I was like, oh man, this is great. I'm really, really digging this, this group of people. I told them to go rearrange the lot, right? And they went to go rearrange the lot. They're all standing around one car. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Let me go see what's going on out there. I'm standing around one car. Every single one of them didn't know what a stick was. Did not know how to drive a manual freaking transmission. I was like, oh man, what did I do? <laughs> I was the only person in the dealership at the time that could test drive anybody on a manual transmission. Oh man, what did I do? But you know what though, I challenge the status quo. I look for someone outside the automotive industry, someone who didn't necessarily have experiences, but did have experience in wanting to serve others. Uh, wait staff, uh, bartenders, uh, baristas. I actually hired this one lady, uh, which was great. It actually turned out to be our controller. Um, worked at a, uh, as a teacher at a kindergartner, uh, as a kindergarten teacher which made a lot of sense to me afterwards I hired it. I'm like, okay, herding and managing little kids, car dealerships and salespeople. <laughs> Shit, there's a lot of similarities here. She was great at it, she was absolutely phenomenal. Um, boy, did she have manager literally written all over her and she became, became a manager quite quickly. Uh, I don't know. There's almost as easily, uh, easy as many nosebleeds and fist fights. Um, I don't know. <laughs> He took the other half of my commission. Yeah, okay. Anyways, you guys got my point there. Um, and then really what's fo what, focusing on what actually moves the needle, right? Not necessarily, and, and Billy was great at this. Billy was phenomenal at focusing on the efforts, not always the results. Knowing that those efforts were going to the bring the results that he wanted in the first place, but really spending that time and honing in on each individual person's efforts and developing those efforts, training those efforts and coaching those efforts. Leaders don't take credit. Um, if you guys ever watched the movie, you know, you'll see Billy doesn't actually stay on the field when the ball games are playing, all right? You know, is he trained the team, he developed the team and he stayed back behind to let the team do what they were trained and coached and developed to do, right? When the team was being uber successful during that, during that great season that they had, it wasn't Billy taking the responsibility for it, even though everybody in the industry wanted to give Billy the responsibility for it. It was no, it was the team. It was always, always, always about the team. Not an individual, not an individual, but the team and that effort. Again, developing out that culture. All right, I always like, like to think this when I go into a dealership. I go WWBD. Now, uh, you can, there's a bunch of other acronyms for that or versions of that, and I got share, someone shared me as few of those. Maybe I shouldn't have put it up there. But anyways, uh, this is what it does mean. <laughs> what would Billy do, okay? Which culture would Billy run, all right? The superstar culture or the science-driven team culture, okay? In a superstar culture, all right, our process, our technology, our enabling, our skills are all defined by our superstars. <laughs> Okay, this like, I seriously I had a meeting like a few weeks ago. This was so awesome. Uh, we go in there um, a couple months earlier. We'd help the dealership roll out a brand new CRM system, right? Uh, CRM company came in, did their training, did their coaching, 
And then they asked me to come in and kind of help out a little bit more with the management to kind of really understand the uh, WIFM effect. Is anybody familiar with the WIFM effect? All right, what's in it for me? Um, I find from a vendor's perspective, by the way, hey guys, this is great input for you vendors, is that we do a really good job of training and, training and coaching on our product, but we don't necessarily do a great job of identifying what's in it for that person. So I'd come in and I did this for them, and uh, then I'd come back a few weeks later, just kind of check in and realize that the usage of the system was pretty much non-existent. So when I come to ask why, it was because, well, John and Jackie don't want to use it. <laughs> Who the fuck is John and Jackie? <laughs> it's like, I wanted to know. I was like, is, is, do, I, I thought this was a single owned point. Like, what do you, um, is, there, is there other owners? Maybe I wasn't aware, right? No, I come to find out, who do you think John and Jackie was? Top Damn straight. <laughs> it was their two top sales people. And a coup was going on. I'm like, oh, hell no, this ain't going to happen. All right, I took John and Jackie from the side, and I whiffed them the crap out of them. Um, I know that sounds odd. Um, but no, I did. I, I really kind of sat down with them, developed it. I said, guys, this is what's in it for you. All right, and by the end of that meeting, I got a commitment from them that they were going to commit to using the thing. And then we scheduled out an accountability schedule, which allowed me to kind of call them and just really you know, check in with them and then call them out on their bullshit when they weren't actually using the system. So you know, that's not what we want. We don't want our systems, our technology, our skills, our processes to be fined by our, by our superstars. No, we want our processes, our technologies, um, our enablement and skills to be all built up to the team. So we got to, got to got to get away from the superstar culture. Plus, the other thing too, guys, the superstar culture don't exist anymore. They're painful. <laughs> yes, they are painful. Um, and they're pains in the ass, we'll just say that. Um, no, but guys, finding a 30 car a month salesperson anymore, like, it's not really around there anymore. And, and when you do, it doesn't necessarily match into your team. They just become another superstar within your, within your organization. And, and this is true not in just automotive. I mean, this is true in all organizations across the board. The oh, yeah, 100%, right? It's all, it, it, you know what? When we're building our processes and our efforts up to our team, that's where we're actually going to see the most amount of success. Plus, the other thing, too, is this is what's going to define out that culture. Okay, but we want to do this through data, okay? So this is a great little exercise. I uh, actually snapped this off of a buddy of mine, Dan Liska, if he's watching. Thanks, Dan. Peace out. I love you. Um, but uh, he really kind of broke it down of how does your company or you yourself kind of look or approach data, right? Are you in data denial, right, where the organization starts with an active distrust of the data? I was in a dealership the other day speaking to a manager, came right out of her mouth. Well, I just don't think it's accurate. It's not right. There's just no way we're that bad. So therefore, everything else in the system has to be absolutely wrong, okay? Is it data indifference? Uh, your dealership has no interest in whether the data is collected or used. <laughs> Big chunk of dealerships are kind of sitting in this space, okay? They just don't care, okay? Are we data aware? I'm finding more and more of this, and I'm really happy the fact that I'm seeing more and more of this, is that the dealership is collecting data and may use it for monitoring, all right, but does not base decisions on it, okay? So, you know, I'll get some managers say, hey, look, I'm using it to kind of monitor my team to determine how loud or how quiet I yell at them. So I'm going to use the data for that, but I'm not necessarily going to use that data to make decisions to develop up better processes. All right, are we data informed? Managers use data selectively to aid decision making. Selectively using data. I'm going to use, you know, I like, and, um, Sean was talking about this earlier, how data can tell pretty much any story, right? Like we can make data pretty much tell any story that we want. Well, I like this story. Um, no, I don't like that story. I'm not going to use that data. Uh, this story, oh, that, oh that, I look like a superstar in that story. I'm going to take that story, all right? That's where we kind of are with data informed. Data driven, that's where we want to be. Data plays a central role in as many decisions um, as possible across our entire organization, okay? Across all departments, data makes, uh, plays a big, big part in that. Okay? First, op, first part of creating a data-driven culture is understanding where the hell you are. 
So you know, you can ask yourselves, automotive, non-automotive, ask yourselves, or even as yourself, or as a team, where am I sitting right now? This will kind of give you a roadmap to where eventually you want to go. Okay. Now let's talk about data-driven processes and goal development, which is like one of my favorite things. In fact, you know, it's funny. Um, I run a marketing company. <laughs> a lot of people don't actually know that. Um, I, I guess because the content I put out there, actually, they go, well, don't you just like talk and shit? I'm like, yeah, I do that too. Um, but no, that is what we do. Okay. Uh, the, the funny part of running a marketing company is that I actually probably spend 70% of my time discussing goal development and processes and probably only 30% of my time ever talking about marketing, right? If you guys are currently working with a marketing vendor, if your marketing vendor does not truly understand what your processes are or what your goals are, then I'll guarantee you right now, hands down, I don't need to take a look at any data at this point, then they're just not meeting your guys' needs. And those campaigns or ads that they're running is not gonna be in line. Every, every agency you work with has to know what your process is and clearly has to know what your guys' goal, uh, goals and objectives are. Okay, a goal. Think of it this way, guys. A goal is a description of a destination, all right? I'm here, I wanna get over there, okay? Really pretty simple. Well, you think it'd be simple. You'd be amazed how many people, how many dealerships I walk into. A simple question. Hey guys, what's the goal? Well, you know, it's, it's this and this and it's that. And it's, okay, that's cool, man. Like, so where is it? What do you mean? All right. Goals don't exist unless they're defined, written down, and out in the open for everyone to see. Okay? Neither do processes, by the way. <laughs> but if the goal is not written down and out in the open, it simply does not exist. All right. A process is the measurable efforts of the progress that is needed to get to the destination, okay? I say measurable. And we talk a lot about processes, the importance of process, okay? The one thing that doesn't get talked a lot about in processes is the measurable elements of it, all right? Processes need to have two important things, all right? A, a process has to be defined and written down. <laughs> I was in a dealership the other day um, and I was, casually asking the, the uh, sales manager, I said, what's your delivery process? He's like, oh, let me tell you. And he went through and depicted this beautiful, beautiful delivery process. I was like, dude, that's awesome. Like, you guys do this like all the time? Well, yeah, all the time. Okay, that's cool. He had to take a phone call, I excuse myself. So I'm standing out in the showroom talking to some of the sales people. I said, hey man, the manager is just telling me about this sick ass delivery process. And he was like, and I'm like, yeah, you guys do this and this and this. And the guy goes, no, we don't. Like, what do you mean? Well, what do you do? One guy tells me. That's one of the other ladies that are there. What do you do? She tells me. I grab one of the, I said, at this point now, this is just getting weird. I go ahead and grab a third person just to check. Sure enough, yeah, I got three totally different variations of what this manager thought this amazing delivery process was. Okay? If that process is not written down, it doesn't exist. If the goal is not written down, it doesn't exist. Straight up, that simple, okay? That process needs to be written down and needs to have measurable elements, okay? We have to measure the effectiveness of the process. Otherwise, if we're ever gonna adjust the process or make it any better for ourselves, then we're just gonna be wild ass guessing on what we should do. Again, using the data that's at our fingertips to identify if our process is right. So, um, I own a Mitsubishi dealership. Some of you guys know that, some of you don't, all right? So I own a Mitsubishi dealership, all right? Not like the biggest household name in like the car industry, you know? I mean, they were kind of known for like having like 10 year warranties and you know, the Lancer, which hasn't really changed in like 16 years, you know? So I'm not saying like the best, like the easiest freaking brand in the world to sell, okay? But I knew, all right, based on the size of the store that I had, all right, and the amount of people that were coming in looking for a Mitsubishi, not a lot, in Cambridge, Ontario, Okay, I had to close at 40 to 45%. Like, it straight up was not even an option, all right? Anything under that, I wasn't gonna make any money, okay? So, developing out my processes and being able to measure the effectiveness of those processes gave me the ability to alter and pivot and change, flip around, totally throw away, restart, okay? So that I could get to that destination. 
okay? Processes have to be written down, have to be measurable. Don't worry, it's going to work. Trust me. All right. The sweet spot, okay? This works because we're here, right? You know, a batter gets less than half a second to decide where the sweet spot is going to be when a baseball is coming down at them. Actually, I think it's even less. Is it less than half a second? Yeah. It is, right? Yeah. yeah. There's not a hell of a lot of time to decide. So the amount of preparation that goes into it is astronomical. And it's not something as simple as picking up the bat and let's swing it. So you guys all saw the, two, the window that's crashed over here, right? The same batter hit the window in July, okay? Came back in August for another game, hit the exact same frickin' window. Two months apart. Can you imagine how much time that was spent developing out his sweet spot, his process, to the point where his results were so insanely consistent that he can hit the exact same window from, God, I don't know, how far away are we? 425. Okay, 425. That's a... <laughs> I think that came out of the box. <laughs> but I'll go with it. Four... <laughs> 425 feet, man. That's, that's some serious consistency there. Okay. Knees should be slightly bent. Feet should be shoulder width apart, all right? Shoulders facing the pitcher, hips and shoulders need to be squared up. Tip of the bat has got to be pointing at least 25 to 35 degrees, okay? All of these things are going through this person's mind in half a second, okay? The only way, the only way that these guys are able to do what they do is because that process is clearly defined and the measurables are clearly defined. And they continue to use that data to better themselves and to better the team. Do, 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 do. It's going to come. Here we go. There we go. Measurable results. OBP. Anybody know what that means? On base percentage. On base percentage. All right. The one thing I do love about professional sports, and Billy was really great at it as well, is... They focus on the efforts, knowing that if I focus on the efforts, the results are going to come. Okay? Do they measure the amount of runs in a game? Absolutely. But the number that is constantly monitored and pretty much determ determined if you're a good player or not is this number right here, your on-base percentage. All right? Is the efforts that go into getting those runs that they define to be more important than the run itself. But for some reason, in the industry, we got this like all back ass backwards. Like I'm more concerned about how many deals I'm gonna close, not necessarily the efforts my team have put into it, okay? Now, I mean, even if it's something simple as just a, a service walk around, okay? I got a five point service walk around, okay? I love service walk arounds, by the way, guys. Like, I mean, honestly, they're probably one of the most important parts, you know, in a business. You wanna talk about creating retention, Maintaining that customer, all right, <laughs> yeah. building out opportunities and trust, you know, to, 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 further, to further sell or take care of, their, of, of the customer's needs, it, it all starts right there at that walk around, right? And there's five points to it. But what we're doing is we're measuring if, this, if the service advisor just did a walk around. Oh, you did a walk around, pat on the back. You did a good job. We didn't measure the five points that are required to get a good walk around. All right, customer's doing a test drive, okay? Congratulations, you took your customer on a test drive. Yay, we're excited. That's the results, okay? We have to define out what are the six or seven things, all right, that's going to, oh gosh, I'm looking at my time, sorry. Uh, the, six, the six or seven things that are gonna make up what that test drive is gonna look like for us, right? And then when we do do that, we actually have to measure this shit. By the way, it's an Excel sheet. You're gonna love it. Isn't that pretty? I did, it's like, it's got colors. It's high tech, dude. It's, dude, it's seriously high tech, right? I know, oh, man, you gotta watch out for this stuff. Um, and I put colors on it too. You put colors on yours? Isn't that best? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then this is like, you're kind of in between, you should be concerned about. Yeah. Spreadsheets are great, guys. 
Um, but no, seriously, guys, measurable efforts, okay? Building a data-driven team. Okay, I love this part. Now, building a data-driven team, everyone assumes it starts with the team. Not actually true at all. It starts with the recruitment. Okay, we gotta change the way we're recruiting people. All right, these ads that are out there, you know, six-figure income, huge opportunities, lots of traffic, it's a bunch of bullshit, okay? All right, what people are looking for right now to be a part of the team, culture is the new currency, okay? They wanna know what your culture is. Do you have a culture? Have we defined the culture, all right? I need to know, before I even reply to that job posting, is that what am I getting myself into? What, what kind of team am I walking into, right? Every, you know, if you follow sports, all right, you, you have a favorite team, or maybe multiple favorite teams. And one of the things you love about the team is the culture. Like you really want to be a part of that. You want to own that culture. That needs to be defined way before we even hire them, okay? Then hire. Talk is cheap, okay? Action is everything, okay? We want to not only meet expectations when we hire someone, but we need to exceed their expectations. Okay? You need to have, again, a defined, what does defined mean? Written down, all right, process of when we hire someone on, what does the first day look like? What does the second day look like? What does that second week look like? They finally get the laptop. Yeah, like, you know, I mean, I started in the industry. It was like, here's, here's the keys, and there's some brochures, and go sell some cars. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, would you mind cleaning the desk out from the guy that's no longer with us before? You know, you scrummage through and find, oh my God, this guy worked like three weeks. Um, <laughs> okay. Action, all right? You need to have an onboarding plan, okay? You bring these people in, you, everything needs to be structured out. You know, when is this person, all the way down to the car jockey, all right? Everyone needs to spend time in each department. In fact, I love having manager lunches. All right, we're all the new hires, all right, throughout the first month that they're brought in goes and has an off-site lunch with each manager. All right, you want to know a quick way to actually really buy into the culture, those managers should really be the ones that can define that out the best. Okay, train. Just an ounce of prevention. <laughs> okay. I'm still amazed that we're, we're skipping this part entirely, all right? Training. we got to train these guys, not just on the activities, but what does it mean to sell a car here? Okay, it's not just the... 10 steps to the cell, no, 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 it's the 10 steps to the cell at ABC Motors. How do you guys define it, all right? It's not necessarily about how you guys do it, but why you guys do it. That culture is what the, the, the new hires are looking for. And then we got a coach, holy crap, guys, we got a coach. You know, like, I'll tell you, this right now is probably one of the biggest reasons we have revolving doors. I fucking hate that, by the way, you know? Someone told, I was, I, was, I was telling somebody the other day, I was going up to a dealership up in the north, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, uh. they got like a revolving door up there. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, why? Like, it, it got to the point now where there are certain dealerships actually are known as just having revolving doors. I'll tell you why they have revolving doors, because they spend no freaking time coaching their team. All right? Again, goes all the way back to my, to my, to my um, culture. All right? I want to be trained on the activities, absolutely, but I need to be coached. You need to be co-sedged as an individual. And then we need to repeat, okay? It's recruit, hire, train, coach, repeat. This is the constant cycle that we always need to be ourselves in. By the way, this never turns off, okay? You're never gonna stop doing this, okay? I had a, I had a dealership the other day, I would tell me, and, and they started doing this, like, Jason, we've been doing this, but like, I'm almost like a little top heavy. I got like, I got, like too many. I said, well, call a guy down the street. Yeah, but he's my competitor. Okay, fine, call his competitor. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, if you guys are doing this and you guys are developing out great people, all right, you're gonna continue, and you're always, always, always gonna have your, pit of the, or your pick of the litter, okay? Uh, one thing I'm gonna add to this, and it wasn't up there when I did the slide, but I think it's so, so, so important, is um, personal growth plans, okay? I actually think it needs to be a part of the in-between here, the training and coaching. Like, we do a good job of telling new hires that we come on board, like, here's what we're gonna do, man. We're gonna sell like a thousand cars this year. And you're gonna be like responsible for 200 of them. What the fuck does that mean, right? 
Okay? We love to tell them all right, what our growth plan is. Do you know how many dealerships I've sat in and asked them? I'm like, hey, you know, John downstairs, man, the guy's like super positive. He seems really pumped. Like, why? Like, do you like what's his like what's his why? You know, what's his, what, what what are you guys doing with him? Like, I'll be honest with you, I, you know, if you, you gotta keep this up. You guys don't you don't have a plan for him? What which direction are you taking him? Are you rooming him for manage? No, 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 no. The guy's great at sales. What? But has anybody actually talked to him like what the hell he wants? All right? Having and sitting down and developing out a personal growth plan, all right, with each of your new hires is going to be so insanely ROI positive, okay? Uh, I did this as uh, just kind of a practice with uh, one of our clients. Sat down, one guy just straight up told me, he goes, look, man, I'm just trying to save money so that I can get out of my mom's basement. I was like, shit, that's cool. Let's sit down and create a personal growth plan of how we're going to get there, all right? Here's how many cars it's going to take. What's that apartment cost? I don't know, man. Like, I'm going to get like a basement apartment, like $650 a month, okay? First thing, you gotta stop drinking Starbucks. Okay, then we gotta move into it, all right? But no, seriously, by the time I was done, this guy walked out like, like he had a, a suit of shining armor on. He was like gonna fucking go out there and just like, I swear he was gonna like just kick the door open. It was like, I'm here to sell cars and I'm moving out of my mom's basement. Let's move the metal. <laughs> yeah, like he was jacked. Exactly. I'm using his data. Not just my dad, I'm using his data. That's right. Creating that data-driven culture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, let's get a little more into recruiting, all right? We, kind of, we already kind of talked about this. Culture is that new currency. Does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. This is what people want to buy into, not a six-figure income. They want to know when they come to work that there's something there for them. There's a purpose, all right? That collectively as a team, we're all working together towards an ultimate goal and objective, all right? And they wanna know not just how they sell cars, they wanna know why the hell they're selling cars the way they're selling cars. <coughs> staff referrals. If your company or your dealership does not have a staff referral program, pfft, you guys are wasting some serious time. All right, you gotta have a staff referral program. What, what, what's that old saying, like, like birds flock together or something? JP, you know a bunch of sayings, what is it? I don't know, something like that. Anyways. Um, what is it? Thank you. Birds of a feather flock together, okay? You guys are going to spend time developing this culture. You're going to spend time utilizing your data, develop out this team. Guess what? Those people know. They probably know some other really great people that would match into your guys' existing culture. You've got to have a staff referral program. All right, cutting the talent pool excuse. Oh, my God. I hear this, like, all the freaking time. But Jay, man, there's like nobody out there. I'm like, what do you mean nobody? This, I, my kids do this, and it really kind of drives me absolutely nuts. Like they, they, they talk in like, like definitive terms. Like, you always do this. I'm like, do I always do it? Like, do I really? You know, I hear this one literally all the time. There's nobody out there. I can go open the door. I'm like, shit, man, where everybody go? It's like the zombie apocalypse out here. You're right, there's nobody here. All right, I had to cut that excuse right out of the gate, guys. There's tons of, there's tons of opportunities out there, but to and what we talked about earlier is that we gotta stop hiring for talent, all right? We gotta start hiring for intent to serve and then groom that talent. All right, always be recruiting. Again, we talked about this a little earlier. Okay, this, this whole process, this whole thought pattern, this is not something that starts and ends. This is something that you literally do all the time. It's a commitment. All right, hire. Explore cultural fit and attitude, okay? You gotta sit down with these people. It's, you know, I don't care if they can sell 20 cars a month. If they don't fit your culture, who gives a shit? The exact same thing down there happens, okay? Why do you think mid-season they start trading players? Okay, a lot, I guarantee you a lot of those trades are because culturally they don't fit. Who is the guy that uh, was playing for the Raiders and now he's getting traded to somebody else? Thank you. Did you I saw, watched that video. That guy flipped the fuck out when he found out he was getting traded. He clearly was not into the culture that was at that, at that place, right? It wasn't necessarily about the money. From my understanding, the guy lost actually a good chunk of money, all right? What he was looking for is you're looking for that right team, that right fit, that right culture. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll have my picture too. <laughs> <laughs> Again, assess skills and team fit, okay? So explore for cultural fit and attitude, but we need to assess their skills and team fit. All right, clear expectations for defined future. Okay, again, this goes all the way back to the very beginning when it comes to hiring, all right? Asking, you know, not why do they want to come work here, but what is their ultimate goal and objective? What do they want to do? What do they want to do 10 years from now? I had one, I had one kid the other day tell me that, oh, I'm a, I want to own my own dealership. I said, that's cool. You got about an hour? I'm going to try to go through this. Actually, maybe about six hours I'll probably take that too. But let me try to, and I did. I kind of mapped it out for them of all the things that I've done and other people that I've known that I've done to get to that stage where I had the opportunity. And, you know, I saw as we were kind of going through it, maybe the excitement started to diminish a little bit. But then, then by the time towards the end, he started nodding his head and goes, yeah, I could fucking do that. Yeah, I can do that. You know, but we had a nice clear defined path, or at least a direction that you can start heading in towards. All right. Under promise, over deliver. All right. That's what you do when you hire. Okay. You don't tell them you're making a six-figure income. Okay. You tell them straight up, you're going to be lucky if you make minimum wage. Okay. You may be lucky when you make minimum wage. Okay. <laughs> Under promise the crap out of this, guys. You don't want them coming. Like, seriously, do you really want someone to come in to your team, all right, because they think they're going to, they're going to make six figures? I tell you, I've seen this happen. New people come in, and you know what they do the first, the first month? They take like 200 clients and sell like 10 cars, all right? They're like, like ping-ponging all over the dealership and outside, and they're just like from client to client to client to client, who's going to buy a car? Who's going to buy a car? Who's going to buy a car? Sucks for you guys' culture. Sucks for your team. All right, train. Train is 60%, but we got to grow the rest, okay? Everyone always assumes that we got to train our staff to do every little single thing. You're going to pick the phone up with your right hand, okay? With the left index finger, you're going to press this number and then the... Come on, guys. Okay? Yeah, you, you laugh, but I'm serious. I've, I've been in these meetings. I'm like, are you seriously telling them how to open up a brochure right now? Like, okay. Um, <laughs> no, we got to train to 60% and then we need to let some self-exportation some self happen here. And then we need to grow the rest of that. That's that coaching element, okay? Document the process. Guys, this is a great thing for you, okay? Use video to document your process, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, if you're gonna be training, you're spending all this time training, you're gonna spend all this time developing out a new team, okay? Again, remember it's repeat. You're on repeat mode every time, okay? This is gonna get exhausting after a while, okay? Take the time for your delivery, all right? For your training and your coaching. Document the shit out of it. Okay, so that as you start to create this machine, as people start to come through, all right, you have a process, you have some assets that they can continue to go back to, that you can continue to use and actually better those, pro and better, um, those processes. I know, guys, I'm going a little fast just because I'm, I'm watching at the time right now. Quiz for digestion. Okay, guys, there are some really cool apps out there. In fact, I was trying to think about the name of, before I came up here. I totally spaced it. But I will let everybody, when I send this deck, I will send it to you. There are a great website out there. I think it's like... 30 bucks a month. There's one, yeah, that's one. And it allows you to develop out your own internal quiz. All right? It's an online thing, it's great. You know, and it's just, you can go in there and you say, okay, guys, like, okay, I taught you now um, how to do a proper payment presentation. Okay? Now I just want you to go take this quiz. All right? We gotta test, all right, if the information that we've, the information we give them, has it actually set in, has it been received. Okay? There's some great products out there. Definitely encourage you guys to take a look at some online quiz digestion. I'm going to pull it up for you. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but the one you, uh, it was? Like look, Cahoots, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's some great, there's, there's a bunch of them out there, but it's definitely worth looking into. All right, and then create consistent efforts. Again, this is all going back to how we're going to make, how we're going to make our training efforts better if we're not consistent in it. And we're not documenting our training efforts. Going back to our process of video. And if we're not measuring the results of our efforts with quizzing or some type of online uh, questionnaire type program. All right, coach. Guys, I, I love coaching. I mean, seriously, I mean, if, if you take one damn thing away from this entire presentation, all right, that's going to bring your business or your dealership, like actual real ROI, 
get fucking serious about coaching your team. Like, get serious about it, man. This, I, it will change. It, it will, it, you will literally see it in black and white ink on the bottom line when you start properly coaching your team. All right? Here's the thing. Never, stop not doing it, okay? I, I, do you know how many bloody freaking excuses I get? The most common, oh, Jay, I don't got time. I don't got time. You don't have time to coach, but by not coaching, it's actually creating more time and work for you in the first place. Like, this just sounds like a, a god-awful, like, Groundhog's Day kind of a thing going on, right? Okay, stop not doing it. All right, data helps. You need to embrace it, okay? If we're going to coach on somebody's efforts, when they're coaching on someone's efforts down there, okay, and literally, guys, I mean, this is the one thing I love about baseball, right? Is that, and you guys are going to see it tonight. It's, it's, it's amazing. You get to watch the strategy and all the coaching go into play in real time. All right? Uh, a certain batter comes up, hits to the plate. The entire infield, outfield all starts to move around. Accordingly, because they're anticipating that, that hitter's move. All right? It all came through coaching. That is like a ballet. It all, had, it all came from that. You got to embrace that data. You're going to be trials. There's going to be errors. All right, but if you continue to embrace the data, you're going to create a better process. All right, uh, coaching is an opportunity for a pulse check. And for me, this really has to do, again, with, the, with your guys' uh, team, uh, personal growth patterns. Like, I mean, this is, my, this is my opportunity when I do my coaching to also check in with that guy and say, hey, man, how's it going? Are you out of your mom's apartment yet? No, I'm not. Okay, that's cool, because I still see you coming in with those pumpkin spice latte venties that are costing like 10 bucks a pot. So it gives me that opportunity to continue to coach you, every, uh, coach you individual. So it's an opportunity for a pulse check, okay? Job, per, uh, job performance versus personal worth, okay? This has so much to do with coaching, okay? Your job performance is not your personal worth. But when we don't coach someone, this is how they feel, okay? Do you know how many managers, salespeople, I have seen get into this business with nothing but a light in their soul and a happiness to be there? And I go back two months later, they look like me. A little overweight, lost all their hair, smoking six packs of cigarettes a day. And just, just, just sounds like crap, right? Without coaching your team and only training and only focusing on the results, all right, I don't care who the person is out there, they're going to assume that their job performance is their personal worth, and it ain't. All right, big opportunity when you're doing your coaching. <laughs> Lastly, guys, your super team comes back down to it. Guys, gonna we're all going to do this together. You guys ready? Let's do it together. Recruit, hire, train, coach, repeat. Thank you guys so much. That's my time. So, um, awesome job, by the way. You're attractive man. Um, I try. What's going to happen now? First of all, I wanted to uh, truly, I'm truly honored to have been part of this for the last, uh, well, this year, five events. And uh, Jason, Digital Dealership Solutions, strategy with Jason. Niall and the whole crew, I want to give everyone, just give them a whole huge round of applause. <laughs> this is a hell of a lot of effort. And, and can everyone agree? This is a fucking awesome venue. <laughs> you can watch the game. So what's going to happen now? It's really cool. We break. We're going to go out into, don't hang around the restaurant. Go to the uh, bar or the lounge. We will do some Q&A, but yeah, go ahead. We're going to actually reorganize this for dinner. And for the Blue Jays game, so all, all the chairs and tables will be in viewing mode when we come back in. But to start, anyone have any questions about recruiting, hiring, any ideas you want to share with Jason? Well, and before, I just want to point one thing out real quick, because uh, Sean's back in the room now. So this is how you actually spell it, Sean. So I saw on your deck you had this Q and this, this letter A, but in Canada, this is how we roll. So that's how, that's how we do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, two things. First and foremost, uh, Randall comes out September 20th. Yes. Randall with a walker. Okay. Yes. Dude, I find it, you know, going into deals a lot, you hear that comment of, you know, we can't replace these people, it's all we have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's often, you know, they say, uh, you can't find the people typically because the culture of the dealership isn't 
one that people want to work at. It's like sure. It's just, you know, we can't hire anybody. Maybe that's because people don't want to work here. Maybe you change the culture. Pretty straightforward, right? It's like we, we love to... We love to identify our problem. We just really don't want to solve it. <laughs> you know, it's and that is actually and that's a great way to start off is that when you are developing out your business culture, all right, um, a good hard look in the mirror is kind of what you need sometimes. And a great place to start is uh, not only to identify how you do business, but the why. And the why is a really important one, right? And it's it's your why. Okay, look. Um, why do you service a car that way? I understand you got to service it. You got to change the oil and do the filter and everything else. I understand that, okay? But why do you do it the way you do it? All right? I understand that, you know, we got to call customers back and we have to maintain a relationship with them. But again, all right, I understand how you do it, but, but why do you do it the way you do it? All right? When you're able to look into yourself in the mirror and start asking those questions, you're going to quickly find what your why is and then reverse engineer that to start developing a culture that's heading towards that why. That's a great question, man. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Jason, have LinkedIn affected yet the deal trips for you? And, or at least, and also brand yourself as a culture on LinkedIn, or is it yet totally important? Oh, yeah, for sure. Again, that also kind of goes down to that video part. Of, you know, once you really kind of do have that defined culture, of being able to document that culture and put that culture out there on social media and LinkedIn. LinkedIn's great. I mean, the amount of uh, people in the automotive industry actively using LinkedIn uh, on, a, on a regular basis, both professionally and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's huge, right? So, uh, and hence the reason why you'll see me there 10 times a day. Um, Kim is, I, I think so. I, I might be. I mean, well, maybe. Remember, 85% <laughs> of hires come from networking. So yeah. I didn't have any strategy to hire people as, as a dealer being, being in charge of dealer groups, in charge of 1,800 employees, except for LinkedIn and social media. And it was only, it was free. Yeah, and that culture, free. you know, that the, the cool thing is not only the culture really gets effective inside the dealership, but it supports your marketing efforts, it supports your hiring efforts. I mean, it goes so far. Another question. Yeah, just to answer that, I think, you know, if your salespeople or your dealership in general are branding themselves online via social media, you're missing the boat completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, how, how do you show the, the, align, the alignment with what you're saying if your online presence is completely different? Yeah. Oh, we're doing this. You're not doing that at all. Yeah, so you have to make sure that you're in line and make sure that every message you have is the recruiting side. The problem is sales consultants are too busy to do any of that stuff. Yeah, we don't have the time. We don't have the time. We don't have the time. <laughs> we don't have the time. We want the results. We don't have the time. And the rest of your day. Oh yeah. But they and, like and they, me, Sean. I'm real when they like me. <laughs> but the, the key, the key word is to connect. Like, I mean, guys, let's let's say as an industry. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. But if you have that AR clerk upstairs come down and do the same thing, they come in at 9 o'clock, they have a 15-minute break, they have their hour lunch, they go home at 5 o'clock. That's true, totally story acceptable. <laughs> smoke break, they have the, the smoke 15 break. ones of those. But if, if these guys come in at 9, even 9, whatever, they can do what they want. 100%. Because the culture's about no, it. Oh, well, that's the thing. Without a defined culture, that's really kind of the base. Oh, dude, we could do a whole we could do a whole session on uh, we could do a whole session on pay plans fucked up our industry. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna that, that's totally gonna be a 2020 session. I guarantee it. Who else has questions for Jason before we break for the reposition of dinner? Okay, well here. I wanted to also say on the LinkedIn part, okay, is that it's a really if it's used right, not like Facebook. Yeah. Right. So when I see I see the automotive sales people are using it like, oh, this is the deal of the week. It's like no one gives a shit about uh, <laughs> uh, As a business, 
Okay, it's an incredible opportunity to let people have an inside look at your at your business. You want to talk about culture? Okay, so we were having a really hard time getting even applicants for developers in Ottawa. Okay, it was fucking hard. We got Amazon there now. We got Shopify. They hire everyone. So we couldn't even get a damn applicant. We spent fourteen hundred dollars on LinkedIn. Got jack shit. True story. You know what we did? We shot a little office video. If you guys go to Carlos Canada's LinkedIn page, you can see it. You know the show The Office. We actually shot in our own little stupid comedy <laughs> office thing. We got 15 high quality applicants from that. People saying, looks like a really fun place Absolutely. to work. We'd really love to connect with you because we let people see the inside. We document a little bit of what we do. We're a little goofy, crazy. They saw that, <laughs> Just they a felt little. it. They felt something they wanted to connect, right? So well, that's it's actually being up. social. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is a funny thing. You know, uh, when I first started in this industry, there was this big thing of the 80-20 rule. Right, you let the customer talk 80%, you only talk 20%. But for some odd reason, you know, we've all been taught that for years. What was it? Um, what was that? So I thought it was the other way around. I'm joking. Yeah, oh yeah. But for some odd reason on social media, it is the other way around. Is that we talk 80% and we don't actually let the customer talk to us. So, you know, our engagement needs to be there. We need to be engaging 80% of the time and then talking the 20% of the time. Yeah. So you have to change your mindset and say, you're not out there selling. I don't even want you to talk about selling a car. All I want you to do is just inform the client about interesting stuff. And sometimes don't even talk about cars. Right? Yeah. Talk about other stuff. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not about the sale, right? It's what are you selling? What are you it's selling? selling. I, um, we put a new office together. It was hardly anything of a photo of my team in the office. That organic <laughs> post got basically 10 times the viewing anything I paid for it does. Yeah. I want to work there. That sounds like fun. Man, <laughs> if you want to, if for recruiters and if you're hiring people, the one thing you have to do, and I love this because I've gone through this recently, is thank you so much for your your application. We received so many applications. <laughs> you will get back. You only call. Do not call us. We'll call you. I challenge you, and I challenge you hard. Contact every single person who submits an application with a personal little note. Just say thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. We'll get back to you. Let us know if you have any questions. Why? Because they refer you. I was hiring for 12 dealers almost every position. I was getting 1,100 applicants a month. And I sent little notes. I didn't hire a lot of those people, but I got a lot of, hey, set me out, really? And then they apply. <laughs> Challenge yourself to send a little note to every single applicant, even if they're shit. Because that person <laughs> deserves it. And that person will refer you. Hey, I got a response back. And he's talking to his buddy who isn't shit. And he'll apply. And could be your boss one day. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Hey, guys, I am, I'm, this has been a great, a really great group. And I know the conversation is going to continue. I see, I know, I, and I see the staff. <laughs> I, I see I see the hotel staff in the back going, oh, we got to set up this room. So, uh, guys, uh, feel free, uh, get up, get a drink. Uh, we, you guys can you can take your drinks out to the lobby area. That's totally cool. We'll let them reset the room. They're going to come back in here and have some dinner and watch uh, watch some baseball. <laughs>